a person would benefit from some state of ketosis on, on a frequent basis, if for no other reason than to f really give the brain a heavy dose of just straight energy. Um, not that everyone needs to be as strict as perhaps you and I are being at the moment, um, but I would say the more a person has a disorder or a disease that benefits from ketosis, the more than they ought to focus on it. Like if someone has type two diabetes, if they adopt a ketogenic diet, they will be off all of their diabetes medications in months, all of them. Um, if someone has epilepsy, if they're, or migraine headaches, if some of the, if from 1913, I think was the first published report on this. If there's someone who suffers from migraines, as long as they're in ketosis, they may never have another migraine again. I mean, it is completely curative or preventative for the disorder. Same with epilepsy, that many forms of epilepsy. So depending on the person, they would benefit from being in ketosis forever. For everyone else who's just sort of a normal individual who wants to be lean and keep their brain healthy and happy, et cetera, I would say it's generally prudent to just control your carbs, be mindful of the type of carbohydrate you're eating. And as I said earlier, just try to focus on the carbs that don't come from bags and boxes with barcodes. I'm actually quite liberal in my view when it comes to whole fruits and vegetables. I'd say eat them, enjoy them liberally, but then also make sure you're getting some good protein and fat because there's no such thing as an essential carbohydrate. That sounds controversial, but humans do not need, we have no requirement for carbohydrate. We do have requirement for fat and protein. There is such a breadth of, of diversity when it comes to sweeteners, from artificial to natural to another rare sugar more and more. You know, there's all these random, I'm not random, but a very broad spectrum of molecules that we have developed or found that taste like sugar, but don't have the effect of sugar. So on, on the good end are things like, that have been shown to have no insulin effect. And so, you know, I appreciate everyone listening, letting me kind of stay with that as my framework because people are going to go on and criticize all kinds of other things about other sweeteners. And that's just too broad. That's a topic for a, a whole book. With regards to just insulin, on the good end where they have no effect, it would be one as common as aspartame. So like diet drinks, not the zero drinks, but the diet drinks will have aspartame as the sweetener. Is it a difference? There is a difference. And I'll get to that other one in a moment. So I should be having diet instead of zero. Well, I personally go to diet rather than zero, um, but that's because aspartame is the sole sweetener in the zero, in the diet rather, and it has no effect on insulin. So too erythritol, uh, sorry, erythritol is a little, right around aspartame is generally a good one, but monk fruit extract, stevia, and especially allulose, those are inert when it comes to insulin. You know, allulose, stevia, monk fruit extract, um, aspartame, no effect. Erythritol, no effect. But erythritol, that ending OL, is reflective of a class of sweetener called a sugar alcohol. And that does not mean it's alcoholic. That just refers to the actual chemical structure that puts it in the alcohol family. Once you get into the sugar alcohols, you start to get a little problematic. Where erythritol is a good one, and xylitol is generally a good one, but then you get to things like maltitol and mannitol, and they do have an insulin effect. And what what's, what kind of foods have those? Things? Yeah, so often like you can get mannitol in like artificially sweetened chocolate sometimes for reasons that I don't know. I don't know why the food formulator puts them in some things and not other things. The, the, the problem, I chuckle because it becomes so apparent with some of those artificial sweeteners, like the sugar alcohols, is that as you eat them, you taste it sweet in your mouth and it doesn't have any caloric value in the body because it stays in the intestines. Uh, and this is something that is largely unique to the sugar alcohols, where as it stays in the intestines, it starts pulling in water from the body, which starts to create a fairly inconvenient degree of flatulence and diarrhea. And so a person will know if they've eaten too many of those types of sweeteners because their intestines will tell them so. Mm -hmm. So, but also on that spectrum, kind of in the middle, is the one that's in the zero drinks, which is one called sucralose. And while sucralose is generally not a problem with insulin, it is a sweetener that has been shown to cross the blood-brain barrier. And so the reason I avoid the zero drinks and refer or go to the diet drinks is that Aspartame does no such thing. Aspartame just gets divided into amino acids. We just digest it and absorb amino acids. Sucralose will go, can 
cross the blood brain barrier and I don't know what it's doing there, but I don't want it there. And so I avoid the zero drinks because I don't want that sweetener. Thank but, you. but personally, um, when I'm adhering to this diet, a diet soda is my actual indulgence where I want something sweet. Um, and yet I don't want the metabolic effect of it. 